Oh man, oh man, okay, here we go. A nice, easy, personal one today. Just like old times, right? The theme music's back, we got feedback, and I have a book recommendation for you too. Well, okay, it's a little more than just a book recommendation because, you know, the author's here. But hey, that's right, we've got an interview, and I think you're really gonna like what John has to say. But first, let's do some catching up. What have I been up to? Well, uh, I just got to speak for the second time at the AA Chapter 14 uh, locally here. And I, I don't know, I guess I said something right because they offered to have me back. But these guys are great. And it's really neat to see such a tight knit bunch of people doing their thing. And I actually learned something. Now, we all know that the EAA is really big on exposing young people to aviation. That's that's not news. But I have to admit that I, I never realized how seriously the individual chapters really take that. And before it was my turn to speak, I got to listen to some of them do their planning for an upcoming local air show about who who was doing the volunteering for what and the Young Eagles flights and so on. And, and they were really putting a lot into it. Um, if there's an EAA chapter near you, I would advise you go check them out. It's really well worth your time. Or if you have a young person you'd like to get interested in aviation, definitely take them there. Uh, like I mentioned before, they make a mean pancake breakfast, so you got nothing to lose. Now, as for subject matter, what do we talk about? Well, we talked about why things are different from place to place. And by that, I mean, why are ATC procedures sometimes not as standardized or uniform as you probably think they should be. And I think we opened some eyes, that's for sure. And what else? Oh, right. I'm going to quit droning on about this after after this one, I promise. But for those of you that are interested in hearing my full trip report that includes uh, some 737-specific stuff, head on over to patreon.com slash podcasting on a plane and give it a listen. And let's get to some feedback and questions. And before we do that, we're going to read the iTunes review of the week and then get right down to it. This one is called Crushing It with two exclamation points. It's by a guy named Cheap Seats. Nice. He says, five stars, fantastic product. After almost 30 years of flying and a 20-year hiatus from GA, Brandon's taking me back to my first flight, hitting the nail on the head. Well, thanks, Cheap Seats, whoever you are. And speaking of GA, general aviation, of course, I got a really neat bit of feedback from a guy who's about to go for his BFR, which means biennial flight review. He's looking to try that landing technique I talked about a few episodes ago, and he used the widget on the website that makes it really easy to record a message for me and the show. So when you're at podcastingonaplane.com, on the lower right of your screen, there's going to be a little microphone icon you can click and speak your mind for all of us to hear. Let's hear what he has to say. Hey, Brandon. uh, This is Hotel Mike from the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I was listening to the Approach and Landings podcast, episode number 24. And one very interesting thing that you mentioned in there is the technique that you use, basically full flaps or landing flaps and do a soft field, quote unquote, takeoff, but just go down the runway. That's something that I had not heard before. uh, And I am excited to try that when I go up to my instructor next. I have been flying for about six years now. I have a few hundred hours under my belt, but this is something that I never actually thought of doing. Uh, I do have a flight review coming up soon, so this is, I guess, the perfect time to try it out. Uh, thanks for the great podcast. Uh, really, really enjoyed it, although this was just my first episode listening to it. I came here from uh, the Opposing Basis podcast. Uh, thanks again. See ya. Thanks for the comments, man. And I'm really glad to hear that you're going to work on the technique during your flight review. And actually, by now, it's probably already happened. So um, follow up with us. I really want to hear how your flight review went and if the technique worked for you. I'm really glad, though, that you're doing it with a flight instructor, because as I mentioned before, the technique is sometimes not comfortable, especially for students that have not yet gotten to the the soft field takeoff portion of their flight training. Once you get that technique down, it usually improves the landings a lot, but it usually comes after solo. So that's kind of what I was hoping to do there. But students of all levels can you know, use a little bit of an unorthodox method to sort of gain a little edge or insight. And if your instructor is comfortable with practicing the technique, then you know, I'm sure you're going to be able to really fine tune that sweet spot. Anyway, thanks for using the speak pipe widget on the website. And if anybody else would like to do the same, please, please do. We'd love to hear from you. And you know what, if you're not comfortable recording, but you want to send me something, well, that's great too. You can always just email me. And that's what Haley Dennis did. She says, Hey, Brandon, my name's Haley Dennis, and I'm currently a senior at Ember-Riddle studying air traffic management. Cool. I'll be graduating in May 2019 and recently applied for the FAA, but we all know how long the process can be before I get a tentative offer letter for the academy. Yes. Do you have any suggestions for me while I wait to stay current and involved in air traffic? I currently have a job offer from Chickasaw Industries working as an RPO at the academy. Pretty exciting. And also, do you have any advice for me and my classmates when we do get a tentative offer letter for the academy? Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from you. All right, Haley. Well, first off, congrats. That 
is great. It sounds like you've got yourself in a really good position, a great position, actually. And yeah, it can be a long road to an offer letter. Uh, mine took almost a year and a half. Anyway, in the meantime, though, you asked what you can do to stay current. Well, Haley, here's the thing. You're already doing it. And the reason I say that is not because, you know, you're going to Riddle, although that's great, and not because you're studying management, although that's great too. I mean, I studied airline management myself. And not because you like airplanes so much, but because you've got a job lined up as an RPO. Because, you see, strange as it might seem, the academy isn't exactly reality. And I'm just going to leave it at that. But, you know, while you're at the academy, you're not working real airplanes in the real world. You're working a simulator-based world around a fictitious airport. I mean, it's super cool, but things have to be done a little bit differently than they are out in the field. And there's really just one way to prepare for it, and that would be being an RPO. Uh, For those of you that aren't comfortable with the phraseology, by the way, an RPO is what people would usually call like a a ghost pilot. It's the person that operates the air traffic control simulators uh, that are in the lab. Some of them are voice recognition, some of them are not. But uh, either way, it takes a person operating that equipment and talking back to you as a pilot sometimes would. But, but that's really the only true way to, to study what you're actually going to be seeing at the academy. And, of course, the only way to do that is to get a job doing it. Um, for everything else, I'd just check stuckmike.com. Anyway, some other stuff you could do, though, is um, you didn't mention if you're a pilot or not. So if you are, well, definitely keep flying. And if not, well, there's always liveatc.net. You can listen to ATC of all kinds from the smallest towers up to the busiest centers and tray cons. It's awesome. And if you live near an airport, you could always just get a VHF radio and have it on in the background too. And the pilot controller glossary, if you want to get that out, a lot of the phraseology is in there and the expectations for for the pilot side of things. And last but certainly not least, there's the 7110.65. And we've talked about that book before, but that is our ATC manual. It's it's the order that shows us how we do everything from, from little VFR towers all the way up to, again, busy tray cons and centers. That's the book that that just lays it all out. Uh, it's about three inches thick, and it's not the kind of reading that's going to get you going. It's more the kind that'll, you know, it's dry. I'll leave it at that. But anyway, you're going to get all up in that thing at the academy. And other than that, I mean, that's about the best that you can do to prepare for it because the rest is all going to be fed to you in a specific way. And you kind of just have to absorb it. But with an aviation background, it's going to be that much easier for you. One word of caution, though, is for those of us that do have aviation backgrounds, for instance, like myself, uh, RH from Opposing Bases, we talked about this during our interview, it's sometimes hard to get your head out of the cockpit, right? Like if you have worked another, if you were a pilot or, or you've worked at an airport in some other way, sometimes changing your mindset is really the hard part. It's not so much the learning the academy stuff, it's the the psychology behind getting your head around it when you've been so used to doing something else. So that can be a little bit difficult. I struggled with it. RH talked about how he did too. So again, as a person with an aviation background, Haley, that might be a little bit difficult for you. Or since you're just out of college, maybe you haven't built up enough bad habits yet for that to be a problem. But anyway, keep us all posted because it'd be really neat to follow you into your career path as you graduate from college and uh, get that first job and then go into air traffic control training. And now let's get to our interview portion. So I was at an airport association dinner a couple weeks ago, and my friend Rock introduced me to his friend John. John was carrying a copy of a book I'd heard of on a podcast recently, and I thought it was kind of interesting. Let me just recreate how this conversation went for you, because it was a little bit embarrassing. I said, uh, when I met John, oh, yeah, hey, I just heard the guy who wrote that book on the Stuck Mike Avcast. And he said, yeah, Carl really took an interest in my book. Oh, you're John Graybill, aren't you? I said, sticking my foot in my mouth. Anyway, we talked. He's a great guy. His publicist called me. And here we are. True story. So to talk about his own new book, Private Airplane Passenger Safety. Mr. John Graybill, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm really glad to have you here too, because, you know, when I heard you before on on a different podcast talking about this book that you've written recently, what I did not know is that we have a a really good mutual friend, our friend, uh, Mr. Rock Swanson, and you guys have done a ton of flying together through the years, and I know you go way back. So can you tell me a little bit about... uh, the, your friendship and, and how it's it's gone throughout the years since high school? Yeah, it goes all the way back to high school. I mean, before the first bell rang at the high school we were at, everybody sort of stood around and, and talked uh, about their most recent adventures. And uh, I, when I started taking flying lessons, I sort of dominated the conversation by telling all of my school buddies what, what I was doing, uh, learning how to fly. 
And then one day, uh, this guy walked up to me and said, hi, I'm Rock Swanson. And I started taking flying lessons recently. And that was really exciting that he had, that he had apparently heard me holding forth about flying and got motivated and went out and started learning how to fly. So we compared notes in our youthful days about he, he and I had the same instructor and um, we would compare notes about what, what we were doing in each flying lesson. And then eventually um, a few years later, when we were in college, we were, we decided to, to purchase an Aronka 7AC with a couple of other friends. So there were four of us. And um, the the the, air, the airframe was in good shape, but the engine needed an overhaul. So we went scouring the countryside and found ourselves a freshly overhauled Continental 65 horsepower engine. And with the supervision of the local mechanic there at the Torrance Airport, we took the old engine off and put the new engine on ourselves. That's a great experience. And then, um, uh, I then we were in junior college and Rock came down to fly the plane and it was a it was in a September as I recall and it was humid and actually quite a, a good conditions for carburetor ice and he took a friend of his up for a flight and out over King Harbor the engine quit just bang dead didn't sputter just stopped, stopped turning and um he, so rock lined it up lined up to land on the beach there at uh, Redondo Beach, south of the King Harbor. And there were lots of people on the beach because it was a hot, muggy day. But he saw an opening in the people, and he decided to go for it, and he put it down there. And then I came on the scene about an hour later, and um, uh, we made the decision. We had a mechanic come and look at it, and he, he ran it up and tested it. He, he said that it was airworthy. And so with the permission of the lifeguards and the sheriff's department and the Redondo Beach Police Department, they said we could fly out off the beach. And so we waited and waited for them to show up because we thought they were going to supervise the the takeoff and they never showed up. So Rock got in the plane, we started it up and we put my, myself on the right strut and, and somebody else on the left strut and he ran full power and we started pushing the airplane it was but it was in sort of deep sand and we pushed and pushed and pushed and i i i became exhausted and i just couldn't push anymore and the, the airplane was moving pretty well now under its own power so i let go of it and the guy on the other strut let go of it but as the tail passed me i could see that the tail wheel was completely buried as it was being drugged through the sand and i feared that he would never get airborne but actually he was able to maneuver the plane over towards the the wet hard sand and got it in the air and climbed up, circled up and then went back to Torrance. Wow. What an incredible story. And, you know, for people listening, I, I want you guys to know this isn't just going to be uh, John and I talking about a mutual friend that you guys don't know. There's, there's really going to be a, a point to this and how it relates to the, <laughs> the book that John just wrote. So let's take your relationship another step further. And I know that you have been very active for a long, long time in the uh, sailplane or non-powered flight community. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and I I got started in that. I, I well, I remember that one time, my I was sitting in the living living room with my father, and there was a documentary on that showed sailplanes, and he said he said, you know, I'm going to do that someday before I die, and that sort of shocked me because I was kind of young and I really wasn't thinking much about my father dying, but it really made an impression on me, and then a few years later, um. I saw my eighth grade school teacher was showing some photographs to a bunch of uh, classmates that were sort of standing around her. And I could see that the, the, the picture sort of looked aeronautical, a big white thing. And I went over and looked and it turned out it was a, it was a glider, a two place glider called a Pratt Reed. And, um, she had a neighbor that had this thing. And, um, I showed great interest in it and asked a lot of questions and um, th that I apparently impressed her because a few weeks later she she took me aside and said, "Could I keep a secret?" And I said, "Sure." And she said, "I I can arrange to have you go with my husband and myself with our neighbor to go fly this glider out in the desert." And uh, ended up making about three 
three or four trips with her and her husband, which re- and I got some stick time, stick and rudder time, and got the basics down so I could I could fly the glider reasonably well. And then, um, but I couldn't I couldn't pursue it because I was too young and I didn't have a way to get out to the desert to take glider lessons. So that I had to put it on the back burner. And then later, when I was uh, sixteen. Um, I started taking power lessons, and the the experience with the glider helped a lot. And I was able to solo in eight hours, and um, that was a, a a lot of fun. And I pursued power flying for a number of years, and then got reacquainted. Somebody gave me a a book called The Joy of Soaring, and that got me thinking about flying gliders again. But now I could get out to the desert. In fact, I could fly out to the desert and um, take lessons and get checked out in gliders. And I did that for about three years, renting gliders. And on one particular glider flight, I I was getting ready to, to launch the glider, and this really experienced glider pilot was getting his glider ready. And he said, hey, why don't you follow me today? It's a pretty good day. And I said, well, okay. So we took off and we joined up in the air and he took off and I, I kept him in sight and I followed him. And I noticed some things. First of all, he would glide and then all of a sudden he would pull up in a thermal. But when I would get under him and I would pull up just because he pulled up, I didn't see the lift that he was seeing on the instruments that I had in this rented glider. But it was obviously there because once I settled into a, a steep turns, under this this guy that I was following, I rose, and that was really exciting to gain gain altitude. And we, and then he'd get to the top of the thermal, and he'd leave, and then I'd get to the top of the thermal, and I'd leave and follow him. And we went, and we ended up getting out uh, by uh, Barstow, and um, <laughs> I guess he got bored because he had he had a more high, higher performance glider than I had, so he'd left his landing gear down to to create drag to make the two gliders that we were flying, my rental and his, his high performance glider more equal. And all I was under him and all of a sudden I saw him pull up the gear and he took off like a shot and was gone. And I was by myself, maybe 50 miles out from the glider port. So the only way I was going to get back to the glider port is if I found some lift because I wasn't high enough to glide all the way back. And, um, as I was working the little thermal, I realized that nobody knew where I was. I had no food, no water, no overnight clothing, nothing, and no radio. I was totally on my own. And that's when I made the decision that I've got to have my own glider. And subsequently, I've, since then, I've owned three different high-performance gliders. And I did make it back to the glider port, by the way. <laughs> Wow. Now, when I think of, of glider flying, I, I don't think of something where you're going to end up in a in a place far away and need supplies and, and so on. I mean, sure, I could picture not getting any lift and having to land somewhere less than desirable. But uh, for those people not talking, for familiar with the areas we're talking about here, Barstow, from where you started, that is that is far. So tell me a little bit more about how, how sailplanes work and, and how uh, your evolution in flying them you built some great distances over time and, and tell me about some of those long distance flights that you made. Okay. Um, well, the first of all, the soaring community is sort of divided into those who never leave the, uh, the, the area of the glider port from which they launch. Uh, they, they may go out a little ways, but typically they always stay within gliding distance of the glider port. And for the first two or three years that you, you get involved in this sport, that's as much excitement as you, you could stand. But then about the third year, you tend to want to stretch a little bit and you found, find yourself so far away from the glider port that you launched that you will not make it back unless you find lift. And that, that's a big psychological breakthrough to realize you've got to use your skill, knowledge, and wisdom to locate lift and harvest it and get high enough to get back to the glider port. Then there's there's the concept of free distance, and that's what Rock and I got really involved in, and that is to try to go as far as you can straight out from the glider port um, and keep uh, 
soaring until you run out of lift or until the sun sets, whichever happens first. And that's really exciting because you're flying through different air masses and the soaring conditions vary with time during the day. Uh, early in the day, they tend to be very weak. Uh, of course, in the middle of the day, the conditions tend to be very strong. And then later in the day, they, they get weak again. And it's a constant challenge to figure out about where you are in, in the day because the day is not always, it's not perfect. You know, the thermals don't occur at exactly the same time each day. So you have to, you have to figure it out. And the, so it's mentally very, very challenging and very interesting. And it challenges, uh, it challenges your stick and rudder skills, of course, because the wings are so long that when you're in a tight turn, the outside wing is going much faster than the inside wing. So it, you, the glider tends to want to roll over. So you have to f put in opposite aileron. And, um, and, and, but then, then, then to keep, you have a piece of string on the canopy that you always want going straight back to show you that you're going cleanly through the air and not going sideways through the air. So you want that string to be straight back. So that usually requires you to feed in a little bit of bottom rudder. So there you are doing what you were taught never to do with the controls all crossed up, left aileron, right rudder, and, and you're flying slow in a steep turn to keep the glider in the, in the rising column of air if you found a thermal. So for free distance soaring, what we do is we, we take off as early as we dare so that we won't have to come back. And the conditions tend to be very weak, and we, we work them. And then when we get high enough to go make it without finding any lift to the next safe landing spot, which we call an alternate, and we get on the radio. Our crew, ground crews have radio, aviation radios, and we have, of course, aviation radios in the glider. And we call them up and say, okay, I'm, I'm over Mount Lewis at 14,000 feet, next alternate to Mojave. So they make a note of that in case something happens. Um, you want to know w what the last communication with your pilot was and, and where he was and how high he was. And then you take you, you leave that thermal, that first one you got, and you start your long glide towards where you think and you hope the next thermal will be. And um, with a little bit of luck and a little bit of skill, you'll find that next thermal and and tie into it and start circling and climb up again. And now you're high enough to go to the next alternate. And we got pretty sophisticated. We had databases of information on all the alternates, which tended to be abandoned airports, dry lakes, and sometimes certain dirt roads and other places that we have we inspect um, on the drive back Sunday. Wow. Now, the distances we're talking about here, that sounds like it can get pretty pretty far pretty fast. What kind of distances are we talking about? Well, um, the standard me measure of long-distance flying is called a diamond flight, and it's 500 kilometers, which is about 312 statute miles. And that's how we me measure our performance. We, we don't really consider it a good day unless we at least got a diamond. But we've made... Fairly routinely, we've made flights in excess of 400 miles, and my longest flight was 582 miles. And we had a couple of guys that took off from Crystal Air, uh, which is near Palmdale, and make it all the way up into Idaho, which is over 1,000 kilometers, which is twice our, our, our standard performance measure. Um, so that you can go a long way. But one, one thing that's interesting on these, when we first started flying gliders, we were um, we we relied on rulers and sectional charts. So you'd you'd f f find the glider over something on the ground that you think you could identify on the on the sectional chart, like a, a dry lake or a freeway intersection or something. And then you take this little plastic ruler and measure how far it is to the next safe landing spot, and then do the arithmetic in your head of about. Whether and make a judgment about whether or not you could make it to the next alternate without finding any additional lift. Wow. And that was that was sort of tough. But then when GPS came on the scene, the performance just skyrocketed because some of the some of the glider guys were software engineers and they developed uh, software for these little uh, 
personal digital assistants, and we had mouth those in the glider, and you could you could tap. That way, the the software the glider knew where you were, and then you'd tap the airport you wanted to go to, and it would tell you how much altitude you need to make it to that airport. And it had the winds aloft, it had all the information it needed to to help you make that decision. What that meant means, though, that in the high performance gliders, we would make jumps often that were in excess of 50 miles, which means you can't see the alternate, but you you know it's there on faith <laughs> because the it says it's there on the chart or your information tells you there. But it's a little bit intimidating to look out over this Martian moonscape kind of terrain out there up in, uh, up in northern Nevada and realize, wow, and I can't even... I can't even see where I'm going here, but you you make the glide and you glide and you go and go and go and finally things start to come into focus as you get closer to your, to your destination. Wow, what a sophisticated way to to add a new level to what's already one of the most analog, unsophisticated ways of flying that there is. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. All right. Well, let's bring it up a little more recent then. So you're now an aircraft owner of powered aircraft. What is it that you fly now? Well, we're between airplanes. We we owned and operated a, which we bought new, a Cessna Turbo Skylane. We had it for 11 years. And it, we flew that all over the place, including this, all, all the way to West Virginia, very near the East Coast. Wow. Okay. So and it had a, had a Garmin G1000, which was really a lot of fun okay, so to it, use. So a 2006 uh, Skylane Turbo, um, I know those inside and out. So you're looking at a, it's a G1000 bird. Uh, not a whole lot of variance when it comes to options in those. They were all pretty standard except for the the color and a couple add-ons. But um, so it's a G1000 with, uh, since it's a turbo, that means it had built-in oxygen for four. And then at that year, it had the KAP140 two-axis autopilot. Is that correct? You got it. Okay, sounds exactly good. Exactly right. Awesome. So yeah, what a, what a great... Uh, what a great setup. So discuss maybe if you would for a second your favorite features of, of that whole system. Um, the favorite. Well, I, well, I guess the, the displays and the, uh, the, the GPS navigators, we, we virtually never used the VORs, which we had two, of which we had two. We did everything but all of our navigation was via GPS, and that was really cool. And um, we go to San Ynez uh, quite often and shoot the um, the GPS Alpha approach into San Ynez. And coupled with the KAP one hundred and forty, it was really sweet. Of course, yeah. So uh, I mean, safety and technology have come so far in the last fifty years, and the reason I'm picking that 50 years as an increment is because that's sort of another milestone, right? Uh, for you, as you've received the master pilot designation from the FAA. That's correct. They, um, they do a kind of an audit of your aviation background. Uh, and they, they comb through all of their records to find everything that they have about you. And if you've gone for ratings and filled up paperwork and that sort of thing, they have, a lot of information. And then they ask a lot of information about when you first sold it, what the end number of the airplane was, and a lot of details. And they build up this packet. And if and if you've been an active aviator for 50 or more years, and if they didn't find any blatant violations, then they award you the master pilot certificate, kind of to honor your, your commitment to, in participation to aviation for 50 years. Wow, what an honor. All right, now let's talk about your book a little bit, because with that wealth of experience, obviously I, I would consider you qualified to write a book in, in aviation. So uh, you've written actually a couple of different books, um, this one, Aviation, of course, and then a couple that aren't, and we can talk about that maybe in a little bit. But uh, why your book is called Private Airplane Passenger Safety, What You Need to Know. So why why did you choose to write a book about this? Well, it started because of a story that my wife told me. She was a passenger in a private airplane way before I knew her years ago. And she told me a story about 
this flight that she took with a friend of a friend in a in a 152 and the flight and she had always kind of kind of been interested in private airplanes and she thought this would be an opportunity to get some experience in a private airplane and she told this story about the flight and the flight started off to be quite nice and smooth and fun and interesting and they landed out at the Borrego Springs but the restaurant there was closed and so they had to sit around for a couple hours waiting for the restaurant to open and the pilot apparently had a couple of drinks or at least one beer and as she was telling the story and and the story became more and more troubling and became more more and more unpleasant as the day wore on and involved night flying with no flashlights in the cockpit and and other issues that that could have ended badly as she was telling me the story i realized she had no information that could help her evaluate her pilot's attitude, style, intentions, and competence. And that got me thinking, geez, there must be thousands of people riding in airplanes who really don't have a clue or they have very little information to help them judge their pilot and their pilot's competence and, and as I say, attitude. So that was a prime motivator to write the book. Wow, that's that's a really that's a vivid story and unfortunately that that kind of thing, I mean hopefully without the alcohol part, but even just the rest of it is bad enough. That kind of thing happens all the time. And that that's really a pet peeve of mine and and, and I'm so glad that you brought that up because that that really strikes a nerve and when I see you know people taking their families out or taking friends out and not really approaching it with a professional attitude, it, there's a reason that people are scared to death of small airplanes. And I'm sure there's inherent risks, but, you know, people have a very, very real fear. And unfortunately, it's not unfounded because so many people who don't do it properly have gone on and kind of ruined it for the rest of us. And my, my own uh, mother-in-law has a story that's very, very similar to that one. And in addition to that, my, my personal story myself, I, I survived a plane crash when I was nine years old. And it Holy was Holy moly. Yeah. And and it, and the, the, the pilot, um, if anybody's interested in hearing about that, they can go all the way back to episode number one. And I'll probably do another one maybe where I talk about it a little more in, in, in depth. But yeah, the, the, the pilot of this particular aircraft, um, what we did not know was that he had actually damaged some aircraft prior and little things about his attitude and the way he did things uh were obvious flags, if if I may use that term, for somebody that we should not have been flying with. And ultimately we almost paid the ultimate price for it. And luckily we did not, but you know, the kind of thing is just something that for me really sort of makes my blood boil. So when I saw this book, I, I was fascinated by it and I'm so glad to have you on the show to, to really share why you wrote this. So let's start about who is this book really written for? Who's your target audience? Uh, anybody that, that is planning to, or, or currently is a passenger in a private airplane and um that's really who it's for and now by the way i want to emphasize that I, I it was not my intention to demonize pilots i believe most pilots want their passengers to have a positive uplifting fun and uh learning experience when they fly as a passenger on the other hand there are things some things that um pilots might do that could be noticed by a passenger and help the passenger start to make an assessment of how, how the pilot is doing. And I, I structured the book so that I've identified observations that a passenger might make of their pilot and then ranked the observation as either being a, a yellow flag concern or a red flag concern. Red flags, you probably don't want to make the flight or three yellow flags, you probably don't want to make the flight. But one or two yellow flags still might be okay, in my in my opinion. Sure. And that speaks to the idea that with any, you know, transportation, be it car, airplane, boat, whatever, that there would be some inherent risk, and that's okay as long as, you know, we've mitigated those risks properly and they're properly planned for. So I like that you've developed a systematic approach here that just one little thing that might be a risk isn't necessarily a deal breaker, and, but if you get exactly. maybe three of them, then we may have a red flag happening. 
Yeah. Also, it's interesting that how people make the judgment that it's okay to go fly with somebody. And for example, if the pilot is really successful in some other non-aviation aspect of his or her life, like like a doctor or a lawyer or a successful business person, you know, that tends to tends to make a lot of passengers feel like, well, you know, this this guy knows what he's doing. Or the pilot might be a close relative or, or a longtime really good friend. Uh, or the pilot might be somebody who's never had an accident or maybe somebody who has had an accident but nobody got hurt. And finally, the pilot might be a charismatic um, person with a pleasing personality. But th- those are sort of subjective ways of evaluating your pilot. And the purpose of the book was to make it a little bit more uh, well-defined. Sure. And, you know, one thing I like about the book is that you divvied it up into, uh, I, I struggle to use the word chapters, but they're small little snippet sections where each one would be a yellow or red flag and you talk about it for maybe a page or two. And then there's a really nice piece of artwork or photography that goes with it that illustrates the point. And what makes it, it makes it very easy to read through the book quickly and get the information out of it. And, and that's actually really, that's a tougher task than I think a lot of people give it credit for, because, you know, this is, this can be very technical subject matter, but you kind of boiled it down to, for the person who's not actually trying to learn how to fly the thing, they just want to be able to evaluate what's happening. Um, a very quick read that they could go through before they were to make a flight. And it's not an onerous task or something that would add a bunch of weight to just going on what would otherwise be a fun flight. And uh, I have a favorite section I wanted to talk with you about. It was chapter or section number 28. And that's where you were talking about ATC services. And (laughs) I think it's really cool that you made it a yellow flag if the pilot does not procure flight following. Did I? <laughs> you did, right there, number 28. I love it. I think that's classic. I, I really like that one. Well, yeah, okay. But yeah, I, and I, I think that's something passengers should, would, should appreciate. It's much better to go with flight following than without it, I think. Oh, I couldn't. Yeah, I mean, you're preaching to the choir. I couldn't possibly agree more. <laughs> yeah, no, that's excellent. I, I think that... Uh, you know, as somebody who does both sides of this, I, I think that radar flight following, I mean, assuming you can get it and the controller's not overwhelmed, is one of the greatest safety uh, adding things that you could possibly do, especially in this very crowded uh, airspace we have here in Southern California. Yeah, you're right. So is this book required reading for all of your passengers before they fly with you? I, w- I wouldn't say it's required, but um, if there was, I, I would certainly encourage them to read it and I'd always have a copy handy. Sure. So have any of your passengers ever caught any errors, mistakes, or unsafe unsafe situations that they've uh, learned about from the book, be it, I'm guessing not when they're flying with you, but maybe from anybody else and then told you about it? Well, um, not exactly. The closest thing that happened one time is I we had a passenger whose name was Mike and he and his wife would fly with us quite often, but he, and he, he was a phys- he's a physician. So a, a smart guy, but very naive about anything aviation. So, um, we lo- loaded up the airplane and, um, we, we called ground control and got our ground control clearance. And as we were taxiing, the controller called us and said, do you have Mike? And we said, affirmative, we have Mike. Well, Mike <laughs> heard this and was astonished. He said, well, how do they know that I'm in this airplane? Did I? Did you guys register me somehow? So we thought that was sort of humorous. That's hilarious. No, that's funny. You know, <laughs> uh, I actually had almost the same experience with my, own, with my dad one time when I took him flying. And uh, information was Papa. And he said almost the same thing to me. That's, that's funny. Yeah. All right, John. So is there one important takeaway from the book or, or a big overarching point after somebody has finished reading it that um, that you really want them to be able to take away? There, I do have three things that, that I think are, are the most important or, or rank at the high. And that is passengers should not contribute to getting 
the situation rushed. Rushing, I think, can be very dangerous. Um, second of all, respect propellers. Propellers um, can hurt you, and they should be viewed just like a loaded gun. Uh, propeller accidents are rare, but they're always ugly. And another thing passengers could do is don't buy into the close call situation like, oh, we have just enough fuel to make it. Uh, you know, you shouldn't, the passengers shouldn't buy into things that, that seem risky to them in their, in their gut. And finally, passengers should not adopt the Russian roulette attitude, like, which says, you know, we did some risky thing before last weekend's net we'll probably get away with it doing it again this weekend. And it's not true. Just because you got away with it in the past doesn't mean it's going to work out for you in the future. Absolutely. So I know you've written other books as well, um, not just in aviation, but uh, in business. Would you care to share about those a little bit? The Entrepreneur's Road to Personal Freedom and Business Success was, was 101 tips for small business people to help them um, be more successful in running their businesses. Well, it sounds a little bit like this then. You've got a, a nice little bank of, of tidbits and tips just organized into a nice nice little grouping for people to, to get something out of. That's kind of neat. I like your stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, John, before we go, somebody with, with your wealth of experience, I think we could all like to learn a little something. Is there something you'd like to, to leave people with aviation-wise that, that you just would like to share? Well, the people that are considering learning how to fly um, – I would encourage them if they decide to do it to uh, over schedule because so many things can go wrong that can cause an instructional flight to not happen. First of all, you could have a mechanical problem with an air, with the airplane. The instructor might not be available suddenly uh, or the weather could be a, a problem. So I encourage people that are learning how to fly to schedule three flights a week, you'll probably do about one and a half a week because st stuff happens, particularly when you're using rental airplanes. So overscheduled, it's my advice. Sounds like a plan. I can, I can second that motion for sure. All right. So where can people uh, not, not only just find the book, but where can we learn more about uh, you and the other books that you've written as well? Well, uh, we have a website, nice flight joy.com niceflightjoy.com and the books available on um, Barnes and Noble and Amazon and there's information in the book about my background well as somebody who's read this book very recently I can I can definitely attest to the fact that it's a good read it's a fast read but that doesn't mean that it doesn't also give all of the information that you'd want a passenger to know and back to the point you kind of made at the very beginning, not to demonize it. Absolutely not. And as a matter of fact, I think what this book shows is that most pilots are very, very caring and really do want you to have a great time. And as I read through the book, you're pointing out a lot of things that, you know, a passenger would just want a normal pilot to, to, to do. And I think most pilots out there, if, if you want to take a look at this book as well, not just for your passengers, but for yourself, it kind of provides a nice little overview of things that would detract from, from, an otherwise amazing flight and uh, kind of give you a little quick framework of, of things that your passenger might really want to look out for. And that if they're maybe a little bit nervous about it, things that you could say or do that would fill them with, with confidence and also help you improve your own game too. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And the book can be used sort of as a self grader or a self evaluator. Sure. All right. Well, I'll tell you what, Mr. John Graybill, thank you so much for, for being on the podcast. This is a great book. I think it should be essential reading for all passengers and, and all general aviation pilots, too. And, of course, I'll have links in the show notes of where you can get your hands on a copy of it. And, sir, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. It was a pleasure. So what do you guys think? Interesting book concept, huh? John's a really creative guy, and, and the book is it's neat. It's informative, and it's actually a really easy read. If you want to buy John's book, there's an affiliate link in the show notes and, of course, in the blog post associated with this episode at podcastingonaplane.com. And I'd really appreciate it if you'd use that link because it kind of helps support the show when you do. But that's it. It's a great book, and I would highly recommend it both for pilots and non-pilots alike because, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to remember what it was like that first time we got in a small airplane. Or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's still a prominent memory for you. But if we had had a book like this prior to that, 
I think it's really a neat way to, to take yourself back there and remember what it was like when you didn't know anything about this. And it's a really good self-check for you as a pilot or somebody who's introducing flying to a new person who hasn't done it before to see things from their viewpoint, not knowing all the fun stuff that you know now. Anyway, I want to thank Mr. John Graybill for being our guest today. Make sure to follow the podcast on social media at Podcasting on a Plane, pretty much across the board, except on Twitter, of course, where it's Podcast on a Plane. And that way you can keep up until the next episode. And until then, your frequency change is approved and report back on this frequency for the next episode. Good day. Podcasting on a Plane podcast is presented for entertainment purposes only. My comments and those of my guests, the website's content, and any of the social media, etc., are not part of my official responsibility as a controller or an FA employee. The views and opinions you hear on the podcast are mine and those of my guests, and not necessarily that of the FAA. There is no nexus between podcasting on a plane and the FAA. Also, while I am a CFI, I'm not your CFI. Nor am I your mechanic, your doctor, your shrink, or your spouse. This podcast is presented for entertainment, camaraderie, and fun, but is in no way, shape, or form professional advice. It's not legal counsel, and it's definitely not flight instruction. If you are in need of professional advice, get some from somewhere more appropriate than a podcast, no matter how good this one may be. 